Now, Dr. Stephen Bartlett, so folks know who you are. Yes. Dr. Bart Dr. Bartlett is the Peter Angelos Distinguished Professor and Chairman of the Department of Surgery at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He is also the Surgeon in Chief and the Senior Vice President at the University of Maryland Medical System. Dr. Bartlett has developed the kidney and pancreas transplant program into one of the largest and most successful programs in the United States. Dr. Bartlett performed Maryland's first simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant, as well as its first successful pancreas alone transplant. Dr. Bartlett is recognized as a leader in the development of single incision laparoscopic minimal invasive surgery. We're living longer, clearly, and in fact, many of, many of these uh, we can attribute our ex extended life expectancy to certain life-extending work and innovations by physicians. But at the same time, we're learning uh, about organ failure increasing. Are, you, are we going to blame the fact that we're living longer while our, while our, our organs are wearing out? Uh, should we not be uh, pursuing that route? Well, this we is slightly should, provocative, we, as you yeah, probably it, gather. It's a great question, Al, and I appreciate the chance to be here uh, with the rest of us, but I think, uh, as Steve well knows, we're very accustomed to simply just blaming the internists. <laughs> 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 that's, a, that's a patented joke. Uh, <laughs> Steve and I are uh, locked in arms. The reality is, is that the factors are a uh, number. Uh, genetic factors are probably the uh, greatest uh, set of factors that decide whether you're going to get end organ disease despite even well-managed diabetes. And there was a trial in 1993 of best practice of managing the blood glucose in a, about 1,500 individuals. Over a seven-year uh, time, some received very tight controls, some received um, a much more modest and traditional or conventional control. At the end of that period, it was clear that those that received the tight control, those who could tolerate it because there was a lot of side effects, clearly were better off in terms of having less eye disease, less kidney disease, and less neurologic disease and the peripheral neuropathy that diabetics are so prone to. But what wasn't studied in that study, in which I'm sure there is much more information that Steve could bring to bear, are the genetic factors that decide, the response genes that decide who is really going to have a rough go with diabetes and who is going to be a lucky diabetic. And all of you probably know one of each, where someone by age 30 is just a wreck and somebody's 75 and how in the world they got to even take care of himself and he makes it all the way with very little disease. So I don't think we're living too long. I think it's probably going to be much more genetic factors and care, ambulatory care models to deliver a broad base of care to the diabetic patients that are out there. I think that's probably what's most in my mind about that. Well, Dr. Bart, let's open it up to just uh, uh, organ failure in general, not necessarily diabetes related. And clearly, we're, we, we, we know this is an expertise of yours, and within your department, there is a very strong uh, expertise in, in organ transplantation of various types. Well, so the question, what are the risk factors, and, and, and how can folks in the, in, in the audience get a sense as to what what are some of the factors that would, would place them at the greatest risk for organ failure and how did they avail themselves of transplantation? Right. Well, let's uh, go through each of the organs because they're all different. The most commonly transplanted organ is a kidney transplant. And when we transplant a kidney, um, those patients will have had a small number of diseases that might have caused it. Number one, diabetes. Number two, hypertension. Number three, a genetic disorder, adult polycystic kidney disease. And uh, number f that's number four, APKD. And number three, which I skipped, is the bunch of diseases all known as glomerulonephritis. And when you really just take all those, you've covered about 90% of them. And all of them are either genetic or acquired, but they're certainly not anybody's fault. But there's a lot that can be done to forestall kidney disease. And even when you know you have a disorder that might lead to eventual kidney disease, and the single most important way to forestall it is blood pressure management. And uh, that will uh, do a lot. But we can't prevent renal failure in everybody. And in some people, they ultimately need to come to either dialysis 
or kidney transplantation. And when presenting the differences between dialysis and transplantation, it boils down to that dialysis is relatively safe from treatment to treatment, whereas transplant has some front end loaded risks, but that once you get past this front end loaded risk, the quality of life with a transplant is dramatically better than it is on the day to day to day dialysis because of the requirement to go to a dialysis unit and all of those inconveniences. In the vast majority of patients, provided they have a sufficient health basis to tolerate having that uh, front end loaded uh, risk of surgery, and that's really most of candidates, will choose to have a transplant. Having chosen a transplant, they can get an organ from one of two ways. One, from a living donor, a friend or a relative, and sometimes even an anonymous donor, or from a deceased donor, someone who's been in a car accident or had a heart attack or stroke, ultimately becomes a deceased donor, uh, either through brain death or a cardiovascular death. One of the innovations that we've uh, developed at the University of Maryland in the last uh, two to three years is an innovation of being able to remove a kidney from a living donor through an incision that's no more than about two inches big. And I don't know if that slide is queued up now or not. I don't, that's, uh, well, we're kind of talking about lung first. Um, let me uh, double forward, there it is. You can see in the far left panel, you can see someone's umbilicus, where a two inch incision was made to remove a kidney it snaps shut, we sew the skin shut, and that'll heal in about two days. And on the other side is the actual kidney transplant. That's my hand holding the kidney being uh, transplanted. So that's a real innovation, and it's help, helping us to identify a living donor. Going backward, that is a young man who came in to the uh, medical center in almost complete pulmonary failure. He was looking at a very short lifespan because of his ability to oxygenate his blood was virtually gone. He was extremely ill and uncomfortable. And we put him on a device that Bart Griffith developed in the laboratory. He put him on a portable extracorporeal membrane oxygenator known as ECMO. Now, 10 years ago, if I put a patient on ECMO, it would be something about the size of a golf cart. Now, it can be worn on a belt, and the patient can walk around the ICU. And you can see how comfortable he is because of this min miniaturized ECMO device. If you look carefully at the tubing going into his neck, the blood coming out of his neck, very dark purple because it's not oxygenating, and the blood going back in his neck is bright red. He doesn't even have to breathe as he sits in that chair. It's remarkable. He was very fortunate because he got a lung transplant the next day, he's now at home, back to his home, uh, going through the re rehabilitation. And as I understand it from another person uh, today, that he will be going back to work uh, this week. So all of that over about a three week period from uh, desk door to going back to work in three weeks. Well, Dr. Bartlett, that's, a, that's very exciting, obviously. Exciting uh, that we are making such, such huge inroads in transplantation. You mentioned kidney and you mentioned lung. Yes. Uh, in the interest of time, there must be something new on the horizon. I mean, there, there, there are several more organs and, uh, or possibilities. Anything new on the horizon that, that, that we're doing at Maryland that you believe uh, could, could be a leading edge or is a leading edge in, in itself? Well, it, it's certainly new to uh, most of the people in the room here, not new to me. We've been working on this uh, for 12 years, and that's the idea of doing face transplants. The idea originally uh, was devised when we saw a request for application from the Navy for advanced warfighter protection strategies. The uh, discussion then ensued between myself and the chief of transplant at the NIH Navy program in Bethesda, and we thought, what are some of the things that we could do uh, that would be very novel and could get funded by the Department of Defense? And after seeing all the, uh, the IED injuries in Iraq, you know, we felt a lot of compassion for the soldiers whose faces were being badly deformed by the IEDs. We wanted to put together a face transplant program. We then engaged in a uh, research program based upon the model you see there, a lower hemiface model on the primate. And we made haste slowly at, very fir at the very first. But ultimately, I added two people to the program who really were fantastic colleagues for me to accelerate the program forward, namely, 
They were Rolf Barth, who had trained at Duke, but had had some time at the Massachusetts General Hospital with a leading immunologist, David Sachs, and then transplant training at Wisconsin. And he came to us to work with me on the basic science project. And we added Eduardo Rodriguez from the Shock Trauma Center, who had been recruited by Tom Scalia. We also put him on the animal project to further refine it. And once we saw that these uh, uh, transplants were lasting 450 to 500 days with very little immune suppression, we proceeded with our clinical trial. The young man you see there is the result of our first application of the clinical trial. And you can see from having a normal face as a young man to the devastated face to the early six-day post-transplant to where he is uh, right now, he is back integrated in society. This face not only looks reasonable, but he can emote with the face. He can move it, purse his lips, and express all of his thoughts through uh, his face non-verbally, which is an extremely important part of integrating into society. So he's doing well, goes to Orioles games and uh, uh, Ravens games, and whatever he wants to do now, he's back to work. So he has gone from living as a recluse behind a mask to really back to work and functioning normally in society. So, so that's part of my last question to you, and this is it. You've, you've obviously convinced me and hopefully others that uh, you have a, a real, real premier transplant center that transplants virtually all solid organs and now a composite tissue. Now, what, what makes your program and Maryland so special? It is clearly a destination site for anyone who has organ transplantation needs. So special. Well, what we, are the keys? We brought together, uh, under the School of Medicine, which has so many rich resources, a number of scientists who are all dedicated to this project. And so it's a very multidisciplinary program. We have uh, immunologists, we have geneticists, physical therapists, psychiatrists. Uh, a strong nursing program, and then, of course, the entire shock trauma center and the, all the resources that they can bring to bear on this. But the melding of the scientific program with the clinical program allows us to develop the new ideas and do the next thing. The last thing we intend to do is apply this to all organ transplants. A vascularized bone marrow, we believe, has the potential to make a standard kidney transplant tolerant, meaning you won't have to take immune suppression won't have to have the side effects, and we'll never reject that organ. That's where we're going next. Can you show the very last slide? Or I guess I can do that. Uh, yeah, so that very last slide. And I just wanted to point out that, you know, Archimedes, uh, he's, everybody thought he was very into uh, mathematics and mechanics, but in fact, he was an expert in philanthropy. And I think he was talking about philanthropy when he said, Give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum to place it, and I will move the world. And so I think he wasn't just talking about a lever. He was talking about leverage. <laughs> 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 Dr. Barnett, thank you very much. And uh, on that note, we'll transition to our next speaker. Thank you so very much.